All right, so let's get started. Uh, again, today I'm going to have to shorten the lecture because I have to run back to the Brower Center where there's more uh, BSAC events going on there. I actually have to give a talk, so I will finish this maybe 10 minutes early or so today. Uh, but, you know, just to get announcements out of the way, homework number two is due next Tuesday. Uh, someone sent me an email saying that the notes from last time were not really up, and actually they are. They just, the stuff that I put on the segregation coefficient in oxides is just not in the module. Okay, but it is in the lecture notes that I posted for that lecture, okay, in case people didn't see that. Uh, so today what we're going to be doing is uh, going through surface micromachining. Last time we finished the modules, and uh, this time we're going to go through surface micromachining. Is this thing even on, the volume? Can you hear anything? Well, you can hear me from here, but from the top. You can't hear from the top, all right. How about now? No? Okay, this thing is just not working. I don't know why that's the case. I'd like it to work because I'm losing my voice, having been talking the whole. How about that? OK, that's coming up? OK. Yeah, I don't want to yell because I have to give a talk later, and I've been talking the whole morning in front of a poster. So. OK, so uh, let's see. So we're going through uh, uh, module number five, which has been up for a while. Also in association with this lecture are a couple of papers, which you probably saw. Uh, with the last lecture, so there's papers on surface micromachining. There was also Kurt Williams' papers uh, that talk about etch rates of, uh, in, in different types of etchants, both dry and wet etchants. Uh, all good things to read. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start module five. Uh, surface micromachining. So surface micromachining is one of the more important types of micromachining around, mainly because uh, it is used in a lot of MEMS processes right now, uh, a lot of MEMS applications, I would say. Uh, so the topics we're going to cover are just the polysilicon surface micromachining process by itself. Okay, there's a number of steps that go with that. Um, we'll talk about polysilicon later. We'll talk about nickel. So there's a lot of different types of materials you can surface micromachine. Uh, and surface micromachining basically means you're micromachining by depositing all your films and patterning deposited films. Okay? Other types of micromachining, like bulk, means you're actually using the bulk of the silicon to etch into the silicon and then use the silicon as your uh, structural material. Uh, in both cases, you have all sorts of different effects or issues that you have to worry about, but for surface micromachining, Perhaps it's a lot more important because you're sort of controlling your film properties. Your films are much thinner. Uh, and so these things that we'll talk about, things like stiction, uh, residual stress, topography issues or so, normally those are big issues for surface micromachining. Uh, at the end of all this, we'll talk about 3D pop-up MEMS, foundry MEMS, and another foundry process called the Sandia Summit process. We won't get through all of this today. We'll basically get through this will probably just end up at stiction and still be in the midst of stiction. Okay, but first, uh, polysilicon surface micromachining. Again, very popular process. I went through quickly this process for you before. Uh, it did something like this, and I'm doing it even quicker than I did before right now because I'm about to do it very slowly. But this whole process is based on depositing films, patterning them, so that you end up with a cross-section that looks like this, where you have a structural material, which is green. This is polysilicon. This is suspended above some kind of material that is a sacrificial material. Sacrificial means you're going to remove it at the end of the process. And when you're doing polysilicon surface micromachining, the sacrificial material uh, should be oxide. It's probably the best one to use for this. Uh, and what you're going to do at the end of this process is this oxide will be etched away by hydrofluoric acid or another type of etchant that etches just oxide but does not attack the polysilicon or at least doesn't attack it at a very high rate. Yeah, you can get all sorts of different uh, devices. This is an example of a comb-driven folded beam resonator that we'll talk about uh, later on in the course in great detail. We'll model the heck out of this thing. Uh, but you can see uh, that surface micromachining can build things with some pretty complicated geometries in a single layer. Right? The sky's the limit on the geometry. is limited by your lithography and by what you can draw. Okay, so you can make almost anything with this type of process and suspend it and then move it. 
Okay, so let's talk first about the material that we're using, white polysilicon. Okay, so initially the reasons were that it was compatible with the integrated circuit fabrication processes. And, uh, you know, early on in MEMS, I guess I would say the first time something was surface micromachine was actually back in the 1960s or so. So it goes all the way back there uh, by researchers at Westinghouse. And so a guy named Harvey Nathanson uh, made a metal cantilever beam that was actually suspended. It was made using a surface micromachining process. And you can say that that was the first surface micromachining process around. So all that was done in industry, right, at Westinghouse. Uh, but it didn't go anywhere. Right, so after 1967, a lot of things kind of stopped in surface micromachining, at least for vapor sensors and cantilever type stuff. And the reason for that was because metal was not a very good material. Okay, it's also the type of thing they were trying to make. They were making what's called a resonant gate transistor. There was a lot of other issues with that since it had an exposed transistor channel that collected a lot of contaminants that you don't want in a transistor. But it wasn't until 19, the 19... Uh, gosh, 80s or so, early 1980s or so, uh, that uh, one of the faculty who used to be at this university, Roger Howe, came back, uh, didn't come back. He, he came to, to this university, was doing a PhD, and he introduced polysilicon to some extent as a material uh, that could be used to make micromechanics. And it turns out that that was the key. That was the turnkey that set off a lot of different things because polysilicon was a much more controllable material. By that time, it had already been used as the gate in integrated circuits. And so, why polysilicon? Well, it's compatible with IC fabrication processes. The process parameters are similar to that for gate polysilicon, only slight alterations needed to control stress. So you can use the same equipment that you already had to do integrated circuits, with Ber which Berkeley had at the time, um, with only slight alterations needed to control stress for MEMS applications. Um, those were the days where you didn't have foundries either that were doing integrated circuit research. If any of you guys are circuit designers, uh, then, then your research basically entails doing something CAD layout on a computer, sending it out, and your circuits come back. In those days, they had the fab, that, uh, the ICs themselves in the micro lab. So Roger Howe was fabbing. Uh, he did do some ICs, but there were other guys there. Charlie Sedini, who's now at MIT. These guys they all were in the lab fabbing actual devices. And so, you know, there's where fabrication experience really helps you because these guys have been very successful in their careers afterwards. If you can do fab, do it, right, because uh, you learn a hell of a lot and you become a lot more capable in terms of what you understand. Okay, not a lot of people can do fab, though, because not a lot of universities have the capability. You're at one that does. Um, okay, other things about polysilicon. Surprisingly, maybe, it's stronger than stainless steel. Okay, this is very strong stuff. Silicon is very good. Uh, fracture strength of polysilicon, two to three gigapascals. For steel, you can compare those numbers there. Right? So it's even stronger than steel. So great stuff to use on chip. Uh, it, is, it has a Young's modulus on the order of 140 to 190 gigapascals. These things like uh, fracture strengths, Young's modulus, we'll talk about those in more detail later on. Right now, they may but just be numbers to some people. But interesting comparisons to make with materials you already know. Uh, extremely flexible. Okay, so the maximum strain before fracture is on the order of 0.5%. Usually these are on the 0.1, or something like that for even some very flexible type materials. We'll talk about these numbers too and what they mean later on. It does not fatigue readily. It's a very good material. There's several variations of polysilicon used for MEMS. Uh, there's LPCVD polysilicon, and we talked about LPCVD deposition. Uh, this is, can be deposited undoped, and you can dope it by ion implantation. Well, actually, you don't want to use ion implantation, but that's a possibility, I'm saying. Uh, PSG, uh, which I'll show in a second how that works. So phosphosilicate glass and doping this just by heating up this layer between two phosphosilicate glass layers. Uh, what's called POCL, so P-O-C-L-3, uh, which can introduce phosphorus, or boron source doping. We talked about boron source doping when we talked about diffusion in the last lecture. Uh, and then there's in situ dope LPC, LPCVD polysilicon. We also talked about that formula as well. The chemical reaction, have to add phosphine. It slows the reaction down quite a bit, but you get a very uniformly doped polysilicon. And so there are some great advantages to that as well. Uh, people have, been tr have tried to use PECVD silicon to make structures. 
Uh, why would they do that? They, they want to do this because um, it's a much lower temperature than LPCVD polysilicon. And that low temperature allows you to do a lot of things. You can deposit over substrates that contain layers and that might not be able to take the high temperature of an of a LPCVD polysilicon deposition. Okay, so far though, these PECVD solutions have not been that successful, mainly because the quality of the silicon when you do PECVD is not that good, or at least the quality of the silicon in the university fabs that are using PECVD systems. I know that in industry, you could have much better PECVD systems, but a lot of them are not trying to make some of these devices. Okay, so let's now talk about the polysilicon surface micromachining process flow. So this is a step-by-step. -step. This is something that I'm going to show you how this process flow works. Uh, but what I find in this class is that people, you know, I go through this very quickly and I sort of have to. But you should go back and spend some time looking over all the process steps and looking at all the details. Because later on, you're going to be asked maybe to design a process that makes a certain cross-section. Or you'd be given a certain cross-section or a certain 3D picture and asked to design that process flow. That's a much more difficult thing to do than I'm about to do, which is basically tell you the process flow. Okay? So I just want to tell you, I'm going to go kind of fast, uh, but at some point you're going to have to discipline yourself and slow yourself down after class, slow it down, look through these lecture notes. Um, all right, so before I can even start, let's talk about the layout for this. And so anytime you have a process flow, you're sort of designing this process flow in conjunction with a device that you have in mind. And this device that we have in mind is this comb drive device that I showed before, um, this one right here. Okay, so we're, ba we're basically trying to make this device. So you can see it's anchored here. It's suspended everywhere else. You can see the shadows underneath this. And it's free to move in this direction on this. Okay, now this is a picture of that. It's like a picture of the top view of that. There are some differences between this and the, that other one has different types of fil uh, fingers. Uh, but this is essentially what we're looking at okay, from a top view. And that's really all layout ends up being. Right? You know what your structure should look like, and so you're going to lay out boxes and features that look like your structure from the top view. Okay, but the difference here is that you're being very meticulous about putting some of the structure in one layer, which is green here. Okay, another, other parts of this device are in this yellow layer. There's other parts of this device in this blue layer. And you can even see these sort of purple layers. I don't know if you can see them. They're tiny. You can. They're tiny little dots here, purple layers. Okay? All of these serve a function. And what these are are the types of patterns that you want to introduce into a given layer. Okay? So for example, the masking layers are defined right here. This yellow is the masking layer for the first polysilicon layer. Okay, so in our process, we're going to put a first polysilicon down. That's going to serve as an interconnect. All right? This blue layer is actually an anchor opening through the sacrificial layer that provides anchors for all things that are anchored. So I told you that the anchors for the structure in the center, these things on the edges, these fingers coming in are electrodes. And so if you put a voltage on these, the, the electrostatic force generated between these fingers can move this structure. And that's how we are able to move it. You also can sense capacitance changes here to sense how much the structure is moved. So you can use one side to put an input voltage force, the other side to detect an output current. Okay, and we'll talk about all those things later on. Uh, and finally, this green layer here is the structural layer. This is the thing that's suspended. This is the thing that you'll be able to move. Uh, and I guess I don't identify the purple layer, but the purple layer is actually a um, dimple. And I'll, I'll I'll describe to you what that's for later. That's to help prevent things like stiction, which is a big problem with these types of devices. Um, I guess I'll define a couple things. These are your anchors. We usually call this the shuttle mass of this thing. Uh, these are sort of your rotor fingers. Rotor because it's a thing that moves. It's not a motor, but it, it moves. Right? These are called your stator fingers often, or just your electrode fingers. Um, and this type of drive here, right? Instead of a parallel plate capacitor, you know, usually you'll think you use a parallel plate capacitor where your fields will go directly between those fingers. You can use that too. But there's a lot of advantages with doing this. Okay, you can see the obvious advantage right here is that you can move a lot more. Right, so you get larger amounts of motion. That's important for certain sensors like gyroscopes. Um, these folded beams are also very useful too. When we talk about stress, 
these folded beams actually relieve a lot of stress in your process. And so to solve the stress problems that I guess IC designers don't know a lot about, or IC fab people don't know a lot about, but MEMS people know a lot about, right? you combine both knowledge of how to deposit materials, how to etch them, together with designs like this that help eliminate the effects of stress in your device. Okay, but that's the device. Let's now go in and figure out how to make this thing. Okay, so let's start out here. So I've got cross sections on this side, the actual steps on, on this side. Okay, so you're seeing all the detail on this process. And in a future homework, you're going to see even more detail. Because I'll tell you even more about exactly what steps need to be done for each of these steps. Okay, but at least in this course description here, and let me back up and tell you, the cross section that I'm taking is right through here. Not through the structure, right, because the structure's got all sorts of things going on. Just to simplify it, I'm taking it through here. This includes this blue layer, this green layer, and the yellow layer. Okay, and that's why I'm doing this. Okay? And so, what do we do? So the first thing you do is you're starting with a silicon substrate. Okay, you want to deposit some layers of dielectrics that are not conductive. And the reason why you want to do this is because usually your silicon substrates come as conductive substrates. It actually costs you a lot to buy a substrate that is not conductive. Right, why is this? It's because silicon is used to make CMOS. And CMOS needs conductive structure, uh, substrates. Okay, so usually for MEMS processes, you're starting out with a CMOS wafer. Okay, so there's a conductive structure. Put some dielectrics over this. In this case, we're putting down an oxide uh, using low temperature oxide. Okay, target is two, two, two microns. And the time that it takes with an LPCBD deposition at 450 degrees C is about one hour and 40 minutes. Okay, that's the deposition time. It actually takes longer than that because when you put the wafers in the tube, you've got to pull the tube out. That means it goes back up in pressure. You put your wafers in, pull the tube in. You have to wait for it to go back down to pressure until all conditions are perfect. Then it starts flowing the gases, turning the heat up uh, to do the actual deposition. So I say one hour, 40 minutes. It's actually considerably longer than this to get this step done. Um, after this LTO step, you notice what's happening right here. There's a densification step going on. Okay, why this densification step? It's a densification step because remember LTO coming down at 450 degrees C. First of all, what do you know about that? If it's 450 degrees C, that's pretty low temperature, which means this is not going to be all that conformal a film, right? Uh, we don't care about that because we're just depositing that flat over the substrate. So conformality, we don't care about. Okay, but we do care about how good this oxide is. And that's the other thing about low temperature depositions. The oxide you get is not as good, it's not as dense as a high temperature. I mean, basically in the end, the higher the temperature of the process, the better the material. That's almost a universal thing. Okay, but we're depositing at a low temperature in this case. We could deposit at a high temperature as well using the HTO, uh, but this is just the process that's run usually. That takes a lot longer because it's a slower deposition. But in this case, after you deposit LTO, if you use it, you go and you densify the LTO. You densify it by annealing it at 950 for 30 minutes. Why 950 for 30 minutes? That's just something that in the days when I was a student, we, uh, we went through those processes. We basically did a design of experiments, many different temperatures, many different times and stuff. This turned out to densify the best. How do we know that it densified the best? Well, we put it in an etcher, and it etched the slowest out of all the different recipes that were there. That means we have the better oxide with this densification. Okay, so if you're doing LTO and you're not densifying, you're taking a chance on a bunch of things. What are you taking chances on? Well, if you have a high temperature step later on after this oxide, and you haven't densified the oxide, this oxide can blister. So it can melt, right? It can reflow too much. There could be gases in there that bubble it up. Okay, and if it blisters, that's it for your process. Right, you could be several layers deep in your process. If this thing blisters at some high temperature anneal step at the very end, that's it. You're done. You've got to start over. Okay? So it's a good idea if you're doing LTO de depositions this thick and you have a high temperature steps after that to do a densification just like this. Yes? Does the thickness decrease? Uh, we never really measured that. Uh, but it, it doesn't decrease too much. I, let me not tell you that. Why don't you, if you're going to do it, just measure it. We don't care that much, right? In, these, in this process, you don't care too much because you're, you're putting this down two microns thick. 
and the reason why you're putting it down is as an isolation from interconnects above, you do care about the capacitance between this interconnect and the substrate. So in a way, you do care what that thickness is. You don't want it to be too thin. But whether it's 2 microns or 1.9 or 2.1 or so, doesn't matter that much. But if you have something where it does matter, then you may want to measure it. Okay. Um, after this, then, you know, oxide is, is, is a good isolation layer because that has a low dielectric constant. Okay, again, I'm worried about capacitance from this to the substrate. I want a material with a low dielectric constant here. But oxide can't be my top layer because at the end of this process, like I said in the previous slide, I'm going to do a release step with hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid attacks oxide. Okay? And so if it attacks this oxide, that's no good. And so what we do is we put a nitride layer above this. Okay? And this nitride layer, in the old days, it was deposited stoichiometric. And so this is an old day type process. Probably still the better process to use versus the new day, though. So 100 nanometers of this stoichiometric nitride. Stoichiometric means it's, real, it's SI3N4. Okay, so and stoichiometric means it's not a low stress nitride. This is kind of a high stress nitride. Okay, but whether you use low stress or high stress is kind of a, you know, it's, high stress works fine if you have it this thick, at least for this process. Okay, and it's a thinner nitride. Remember, you don't want to get nitride much thicker than this, because if it's thicker than this, it becomes high stress and it starts peeling off the wafer. Okay, so keep it at 100 nanometers here. Uh, I guess the deposition time in an LPCVD furnace at 800 degrees C is 22 minutes, okay, which is very reasonable, I think. Uh, after this nitride, you then deposit interconnect polysilicon. And the target here is generally around 300 nanometers. Uh, you want this polysilicon to serve as interconnect, so you want it to be doped. So oftentimes, it's deposited in situ phosphorus doped. And for this thin of a polysilicon, 300 nanometers, that's in one hour, 30 minutes. In LPCVD, I guess I'm saying 650 degrees C, but it's anywhere between 6, 610 and the 650 there for the interconnect polysilicon. Actually, for structural polysilicon, sometimes 585 is used, and we will talk about why different temperatures might be used later on. Okay, you then go into a lith lithography step here. And so this is lithography to define poly 1. Okay, so this is the first polysilicon. So you're going to put your photoresist down you're going to, by exposure, then you're going to etch using a reactive ion etching here, uh, in, in this case, carbon tetrachloride. There's other etch recipes, too, using SF6 and that sort. So you have a lot of choices on what to etch with. Here I'm using CCL4. Uh, then you remove the resist, either through oxygen plasma or acetone or PRS. It used to be PRS2000. It's now PRS3000. They keep making better solutions for this. This is just the wet etchant that gets rid of photoresist here. Um, and so you're left with this interconnect that's been patterned and patterned to the yellow everything here. So by the end of this step, what you're going to see on the top of your wafer is all the patterns that come with this yellow stuff. Okay? And the yellow is the ground plane for this device. Okay? And so you notice the yellow is everywhere pretty much where the device is. And the reason for that is because we're going to put a voltage on this device later on. We have to make sure that we don't get a potential difference between the bottom of the device and the substrate. Because if we do, that can pull the device into the substrate. So what we generally do is this yellow layer is put at the same potential as the green layer when it's in operation so that you have no potential difference between them. There's no forces pulling the structure down to the substrate. Okay, that's kind of an important thing. If you're doing surface micromachining, you must have uh, this ground plane. If you do not don't be surprised if your devices don't work. Plenty of people I've seen in the past trying to make these devices have no ground plane. And then they plug it into power and they say, oh, this thing's not moving. Why does it, it doesn't move because the thing just pancaked through the substrate and now it can't move. Friction is keeping it in place. Uh, okay, so I guess another thing I want to describe about this is there's a couple different types of mass. So see that CF that I'm using right here? What does CF mean? CF means clear field. Okay, and some of these other masks here say DF, or dark field. Okay, so the blue one is a dark field mask. The yellow and, and the green ones are clear field masks. So what do I mean by those types of masks? And uh, this is interesting. 
Okay, that didn't do it. I've defined one of these to be my escape key. That's not it. Bear with me, I'll find, there it is. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. Um, all right. Talk about clear field and dark field masks. So if I have a, a, a clear field mask, what does this mean? That means every masking feature that I put down. So say this is a box that I put down as my clear field box. That means that if this is the mask, and that's clear field. Now let me title this first. That's a clear field mask, and after I do lithography, after I expose the resist, and assuming positive resist, then the feature that I'm going to end up with on my actual wafer is going to be exactly like that feature. Okay? And I think I could have drawn this a little bit better, so let me do that because I'm going to have to draw something similar for the dark field later on. So let me do this right. Ah. So that's my mask. That's the glass or the quartz. And that's the pattern. Sorry, no, that's not what I want to do. That's what I want on the right side. This is the layout. So this is clear field layout. And so that means that the mask is going to look identical to this, pretty much. That's your clear field mask. Okay, now if I do the same mask here and I make it dark field, so exact same layout. So why don't I just use the same layout? Let's call this the layout. Okay, and I make the mask now. Let's not even talk about resist here. Let's say make mask. And then I also make the mask here, except I'm making a dark field mask. Then this is what the mask would look like. Everywhere where I had a box would be covered with masking material. Okay? And everywhere the, where you have boxes are now open. Okay, so that's why we call them clear field and dark field. Right? In the clear field, You basically get patterns on the mask wherever you had layout. In dark field, you get patterns on the mask or, or opaque regions of the mask wherever you did not have layout. Okay? So if I go back to uh, this here, everywhere I have blue, since blue is a dark field mask for the anchor opening, those will be open pieces in the actual mask. They'll let light through. And everywhere around them will be dark. Okay? Anywhere I have green on its mask, and these are all separate masks. Each layer has a separate mask. Okay? Everywhere I have green, I will have masking material. It will be opaque to light. And everywhere else in the field, it will be clear. Okay? And thus the words clear field and dark field. Okay? Everyone get that? 
That's important to know because if you don't understand this, you will not be able to do layouts. All right. Um, oops. Okay, we were here. All right. So this this polysilicon layer, the interconnect, was done with a clear field mask. Okay. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to do. I'm going to try to create my anchor points. And for my anchor points, I'm trying to do an etch. I skipped a few steps, didn't I? Yeah, OK. So the first thing, I can't create my anchor point yet. So after this interconnect polysilicon, I'm then going to deposit a sacrificial PSG layer. OK, so it's phosphosilicate glass. You know I can reflow that if I want to, and I am going to. right? So I deposit two microns of this. Again, it's an hour and 40 minutes, about the same time as the LTO. LPCVD at 450 degrees C. I'm just now flowing phosphine at the same time that this deposition is occurring. Uh, identify the PSG, same recipe, 950 degrees C at 30 minutes. That creates a better oxide for me. And then I do lithography to define anchors in this PSG. Okay, and so this is the lithography using the anchor mask, which is the dark field mask. Right, so I on the mask, I actually had a, uh, well, on the layout, I actually had a box right here. Okay, but you notice that where the box was, it's clearing out uh, the photoresist because it's a dark field mask. Okay, then you see the etch going down here, but notice what's happening with the etch. Right? It's an RIE etch using a CHF4, a CF4 helium type chemistry, 350 watts. Uh, and this etch is doing something interesting, right? It, it's, it's creating slope sidewalls instead of straight sidewalls, right? So we talked about this in etching before. And so why would you want to create sloped sidewalls like this? Anyone? Position? Position? Deposition. Deposition. Uh, yeah, so that's a good one. So you're, you're going to deposit after this. You can see this polysilicon there. You're going to deposit that polysilicon. But what are some other reasons? Yeah. Good, yeah, exactly. So that, that's, that's a big one, too. You, you see, in this case, because this is sloped a little bit, this actually is sloped a bit, and that corner is not as sharp as it would have been if you had made this a straight sidewall. Okay, so in terms of uh, device reliability, that's a much better situation. Okay? Um, is there another reason why we might, might want to have sloped sidewalls? Did you have your hand up? Um, no, not really. It's about it's easy to do deep uh, reactive ion etching as plasma. Well, I don't. I'm not sure exactly what you said, so, but I'm going to interpret it as you can use plasma etching versus RIE or something. RIE is more expensive. Now the tool may be a little more expensive, but once you've got the tool, it's not that that much more. So let's. So I've I've asked that question. Let me uh, figure out how to escape out of this again. Okay, but let's go back to this. Let's talk about this for a second. That's why I paused a little bit when I was about to do this, because I wanted to cheat. And here comes the cheating. Whoops. The cheating is not complete. OK. So you often want slope sidewalls. OK, so sharp corners there. Uh, High stress weakens and high stress dissipates. I guess I only said stress in this thing, but the other things that you guys were saying were also correct. The deposition, the stress. Uh, but you don't always just want sloped sidewalls. You also want straight sidewalls. Okay, so you want straight sidewalls, say, between these fingers. So if I back up on this here, between these fingers, right, you don't want these sloped. You want them to be nice and straight so you have well-defined capacitors between those fingers. So there are instances where you want straight sidewalls. There are instances where you want slope sidewalls. And so how do you go about getting different types of sidewalls? So let's talk a little bit about that. So there are some interesting techniques to do this. And actually, let me go a little bit forward in the process flow before I talk about that. OK, so you see what's happening here. We just used photoresist. And I didn't quite draw this correctly to some extent here, uh, but I'll talk about it in a second. 
does just photoresist over the oxide in order to etch the oxide. Okay, let's go a few more steps after this. So after this, you remove the photoresist using PRS-2000. Uh, you do a quick wet dip in 10 to 1 HF. And you're doing that dip with the oxide exposed everywhere, right? Of course, HF attacks oxide. And so is this a smart thing to do, to dip this in HF? Not normally, because you're starting to remove some of this oxide that's supposed to be there. But it is a smart thing to do when you're trying to open contacts and have another layer come down and actually make contact. Okay, because you don't want to take a chance on there being some residual oxide over this first polysilicon such that when you deposit this next polysilicon, that residual oxide stays there. Because if you do have that residual oxide there, you will not get a good enough contact. You may even get an open circuit. And if you get an open circuit at this stage in the process, you're not going to find out until the end of the process. And then you'll have wasted many days or time of time processing this thing, and it's not going to work. So contacts are extremely important. Anytime you're going to open up a contact, always do some kind of wet dip. Don't trust entirely the dry etch to remove all the oxide above this. Always do a wet dip to make sure that oxide is gone. Very short dip, quick wet dip, maybe 10 seconds, 5 seconds, and 10 to 1, Okay, just to remove that residual oxide. Um, then after this is done, you've opened, you have this cross section, you then deposit structural polysilicon. And in this case, we're doing it, uh, I guess in this case, we're even doing it in situ phosphorus doped. That's a long deposition. Okay, it's a long deposition because it's phosphorus doped in situ. Okay, you could do this a lot faster by depositing the polysilicon using an undoped process. Um, and then depositing above all of this another oxide, which can be a PSG. And then once you've achieved this sandwich structure, uh, since the PSG contains phosphorus, so there's your phosphorus in the PSG. So what happens? You've got oxide impregnated with PSG, or with phosphorus, right? You then take the temperature up. What happens to these dopants? They go into the silicon. Okay, so as you raise that temperature, these dopants then go into the silicon. So you could deposit the silicon undoped and then auto-dope it just by taking this up in temperature. And this actually was a very popular way to do things. It's actually still the way we're doing it in the lab upstairs to make home drive type resonators. Why is this so nice? It's, it's nice because you could have much less time depositing your polysilicon. Usually it's, more, it's easier to control an undoped polysilicon in terms of stress. Uh, and finally, when this dopes, it's doping very uniformly, right? So in other words, well, at least not uniformly, but very symmetrically. So the dopants are coming in from the top, coming in from the bottom, which means you may have a higher concentration of dopant at the top less concentration in the middle, but also a high concentration at the bottom. So if there's any stress effects due to doping, they're canceling each other out through pure symmetry through this structure. And this works very well, actually. So that's just an alternative way uh, to do this process. Don't do in situ dope silicon, polysilicon. Do it undoped, and then dope it by using PSG on both sides of the structural layer. Okay. Um, after this, after you've done this, you have everything covered up. Okay? You do a stress anneal whether or not you're doing this doping. So during this stress anneal is when this auto-doping will occur. But even if you're not doing the auto-doping, you need to do the stress anneal, and you should do it now, right? when you have complete symmetry around your, your, uh, your structure. Why are we doing this stress anneal? Well, this stress anneal is re relieving things like stress gradients and residual stress in your film. Okay, you can see a typical anneal one hour at 1050 here. Uh, it's possible to do annealing even by RTA, rapid thermal annealing. Uh, and so it's interesting that that actually works. So here, or RTA at one minute at 1100 degrees C uh, in an inert atmosphere, 50 SCCM uh, nitrogen. Okay, at this point now, we put a photoresist on this and do lithography using the poly 2 mask, which is a clear field mask. That now defines all of your structures 
you can see the photoresist above this, and you're kind of seeing something kind of important here uh, that's being done in this process. And you notice how we really want, in the end, this structure. Okay? But we didn't just deposit the structure by itself. We deposited the structure plus this oxide layer on top of it. And one reason to deposit this could be that what I just described, that you're doing PSG doping, auto doping of this thing. But even if you weren't doing PSG doping, even if you deposited this polysilicon using an in-situ dope process where the polysilicon's already doped, um, you'll still put this oxide mass down. And the reason for that is because in MEMS, you're now talking about some fairly thick layers. Okay, so even two microns is very thick to any IC designer. Okay, so IC designers or IC fab, design, fab specialists, they're usually not etching through two, mi two microns of material. They're usually etching through very thin pieces of material. And I gave you the reasons why. You get much better resolution uh, if you have very thin materials, because that means you have no topography, plus you're not as worried about undercutting in your etch. Right? So an IC process, you try to make things as thin as possible. In MEMS, it's not the case. Sometimes you want to make them as thick as possible. Okay, so that's the direct opposite. So if you think of this process here, first of all, when you're etching polysilicon, some etch types, some reactants will etch photoresist at a fairly good rate. Slower than polysilicon, but not that much slower. The selectivity could be 4 to 1. A photoresist to polysilicon. Sorry, polysilicon to photoresist. Okay? That's still not good. If you have thick polysilicon, then you could lose all of your photoresist by the time your etch is done. Okay? Putting an oxide mask, is, which is what this is, right? So you take, do the photoresist, you first etch the oxide, okay, which now takes the pattern that you're looking for. Then you use the oxide as a mask against the subsequent etch. You don't have to get rid of the photoresist. You could continue to use it as a mask, but when the photoresist is gone, now your oxide serves as the mask. Okay, there's a lot more to it than just this. Okay, it turns out that use of an oxide mask, which we're doing right here, versus no use of an oxide mask, which is what we did when we were etching these vias here, has a lot to do with whether you get straight or sloped sidewalls. Okay, so the oxide mask is one of the secrets to get straight sidewalls, even if your RIE etch is, is not perfect. And so let's talk about uh, that secret there. Let's talk about how that comes about. Um, and let's do that using the other mode here. Let's first talk about etching uh, straight sidewalls. Now let's do slope first. Let's talk about etching slope sidewalls. Okay, so how do you get your slope sidewalls? Well, in fact, this is easy to do oftentimes. You can do this just using your photoresist. So, for example, if I had a substrate, probably silicon, but in MEMS it could be all sorts of things, uh, and maybe I have a layer of silicon dioxide here. This is the layer that I want to etch, and maybe I want to etch this layer such that it's sloped. Okay, maybe I want to etch it down to some contact pad right here. So it's a polysilicon. contact pad. Okay, so how do I go about doing this process? Well, if I can come in with a photoresist that defines my via. Say this is my photoresist right here. If that's what my photoresist looked like and I had a very anisotropic etch, then how would this actually etch? This would etch as follows. It'll go straight down, right? And so in this process, if the photoresist really looked like this, we would get straight sidewalls. In order to get sidewalls that are not straight, one thing that you can do is change your photoresist the way your photoresist looks. Okay, so instead of having photoresist with straight sidewalls, what if I came in 
and I put my photoresist in like this. where it has slope sidewalls. Okay, so if I have slope sidewalls on my photoresist, and that's something I can do by just overexposing. So when I'm doing my lithography, I can use more light, right, for a longer amount of time or a higher intensity. Right, and if I overexpose, oftentimes my photoresist is going to end up looking like this. Okay, so now that I want to etch into this silicon dioxide, if the reactant that's doing the etching has a finite selectivity to photoresist, which means it's going to etch photoresist at the same time that it etches oxide, you're going to have a situation now where you're going to get a sloped sidewall in the oxide. And why is this the case? So let's, let's do this in small steps. This is how I think you should do these types of problems. You have a particularly difficult etching problem on your homework that you're going to have to do using these types of techniques, at least initially, and then figure out from there what the angles will end up being. Okay, but here's what happens, right? Say, say you have a perfect RIE etch. So here, let's even assume perfect anisotropy. in the reactive iron etch here. Even if it was perfectly anisotropic, then what's going to happen? You're going to etch a little bit here. It's going to go straight down. Right? But at the same time, you're etching your photoresist. Right? So you're going to push a little bit off your photoresist here. And I'm exaggerating how much is going to come off. Right? It could be, if it's at a different rate than the etch that's occurring in the substrate, then you're going to get a different angle. Right? So you're etching some of your photoresist off. Right? So in the next cycle of etching, which could be, I mean, I could break this down into small chunks of time. Say I'm doing this every five seconds or so, right? In the next five seconds, what's happening? Now my photoresist edge is here, okay? Which means I'm going to continue etching here, sure, but now I'm going to etch some here. I'm going to etch some there, too, okay? And in the very next cycle, I'm going to etch the photoresist down even more, okay, which means I'm going to continue etching this straight down, but this is also going to go straight down. That's going to go straight down. This will come in. That will come in. So notice what I've done. Right? I have now etched a slope into my oxide. Okay? So just by having a slope in the photoresist and having a finite etch selectivity of my etch into the, to the uh, photoresist, I'm able to put an angle in the silicon dioxide. And the angle that you're going to get is going to be dependent on the angle of the photoresist. Right? So this angle depends on this angle, well, the same angle, but the initial angle here, theta in the photoresist. It also depends on the selectivities. Okay, how fast is it actually etching the photoresist versus the silicon dioxide? Both those together will decide what that final angle is, and that's what you're most interested in. Okay? Now, this is, this is the problem, assuming perfect anisotropy in RIE. That means it etches only straight down. Right? We can throw another wrench at you and say, okay, it's etching straight down, but it's got some finite etch laterally, too. That makes the problem even worse. Right? So what I did was the easy problem. What you're going to do in your homework is a harder problem because we're giving you lateral etch rates at the same time. Okay? And those are not fun. They're only fun once you're finished because you feel like you've accomplished something. Right? So you'll enjoy that homework assignment. But this is sort of what we're talking about. Right? If I want slope sidewalls, this is one way that I can get it. Okay? But what if I don't want slope sidewalls, but my photoresist looks like that anyway? Sometimes you cannot control. Right, I, and this previous thing, right, I'm basically saying, oh, your photoresist has perfect sidewalls, right? That happens every day. No, it doesn't. Right, your photoresist usually has slope sidewalls uh, whenever you're using photoresist. And why I'm doing this when I can also do this, I don't know. I should be doing this the whole time, right? All right, so. What if I wanted to have straight sidewalls like this? 
but my photoresist is not coming down straight. So what if we want straight sidewalls? Okay. Similar type of situation here. Well, in this case, let me take a different thing. Let me say that, let me take exactly what we've been talking about here. Silicon dioxide sacrificial layer uh, with a polysilicon structural layer here. And I want this polysilicon to be etched straight down. Okay, so how do I do that? The way that I do that is I use an oxide hard mask. Okay, so there's some more silicon dioxide over the polysilicon. And let's assume that over this here, my photoresist came down like this. Okay, my photoresist still had slope sidewalls. Okay, like I said, in this case, it would give me a slope in the, in the uh, I don't want that much slope, so let me fix that a little bit. Okay, so it has some slope in it. We're trying not to get slope, but we end up with slope anyway. Okay, so what's going to happen in this case? So the hard mask is something that etches, uh, you hope, with a better selectivity. You know, the selectivity between etching the hard mask and the photoresist, you would like to be high. Okay, so you want the selectivity of uh, silicon dioxide to photoresist to be large. If you have that, then when you do this etch, yes, the photoresist is going to etch away a bit, but it's going to etch so little that by the time you're through all of this oxide, it's moved barely anyway, anywhere. Okay? So you get that etch front in the silicon dioxide. The silicon dioxide is you know, fairly vertical right now, but maybe there's still a finite selectivity here. Okay, so you still, the photoresist still moved a little bit this way, which means that you still put a little bit of angle into your oxide underneath. Okay, if you have a process now where the selectivity of polysilicon to oxide is also large but finite, now you're looking at a, a much better slope than what was in the PR. Okay that's transferring to even smaller slope in the polysilicon. And this now is going to be virtually vertical. Okay, because the slope of whatever you have above it is not affecting your etch at this point. Right, so this is how you get vertical types of sidewalls in polysilicon. That hard mask is a very important thing. You need to have a very hard masking material to get vertical types of sidewalls. And so that's what we actually do in this process. That's why we've got in this process, a um, couple slides down, this hard mask here that was used to do the etching. So to get that vertical sidewall. Okay? That's a trick that you need to understand and remember. Anytime you want vertical sidewall, make sure that the masking material is etched at a much lower rate than the actual material you're trying to etch. Okay? All right. So Going on from here, so we just etched the polysilicon, right? We then removed the photoresist in PRS2000. Uh, you may ash it in O2 plasma. So the other thing I should say about these types of etches, when you're etching something very deep, using a regular type etch, not necessarily deep reactive iron etching, but you have to be careful how hot the thing gets. Okay, so in other words, if you're etching through two microns of polysilicon, don't just blast through the two microns of polysilicon in the five minutes that it takes. Okay, do some etching for maybe a minute, then stop the etch for a minute. Then do more etching for another minute, then stop the etch for a minute. Why do you do this? You're doing this to allow the photoresist to cool. You're allowing everything to cool uh, because when the photoresist gets too hot, a number of things can happen, right? It can come off or it can harden, right? To become extremely hard such that at the end of the process, you have cooked it so much that it can't be removed, okay? So if you've got a particularly high power etching process, don't just barrage this thing with the etch. Stop and let it rest. And you can program your etch recipe such that you get stopping. Okay? 
And so final step of this thing, you, you dip the whole thing. You have this cross section now where you see the sacrificial material has supported your structure here. Dip the whole thing now into hydrofluoric acid, uh, which is a liquid solution, of course. Um, it could be 5 to 1 BHF, in which case it'll take longer. This is diluted HF uh, with both a buffer and with water. Or it could be straight HF, which of course has water in it. But if you take straight HF out of the bottles that they sell, that's 48.8 weight percent HF. That'd be a much faster edge. Okay? And so, you know, you choose what you want to do depending on how fast other things in your process uh, etch in straight HF versus BHF. For example, this nitride may etch a little more slowly in BHF. And so if that's the case, maybe you want to uh, use BHF instead of straight HF. Okay, but it's very simple. I'm making it look very simple at least. Right, you do this etch, everything is free, what's the problem? Right? As long as you know your recipes, as long as you know, right, they give you low stress and stuff, what's the problem with this process? Why is, do some people find it very difficult to do? Well, the problem happens after the process. The problem happens during the process if you don't know your recipe correctly. Okay, if you don't have the right recipe to get these to have the right stress gradients and that sort. <laughs> but after the process, you have some issues. This last step here. Okay, so you notice we're releasing the structures, but I'm saying, I have a few more bullets. I'm saying keep the structures submerged in DI water after the etch. Transfer the structures to methanol. All right, and then do a supercritical CO2 dry release. What the heck does that mean? And why are we doing all of that? Okay, we're doing all of that for a couple of reasons, and that are the non-idealities in the process that I'm going to talk about right after this. So these are some nice SEMs of you know, the types of devices you can get with this process. Look at the sheer complexity of this. Okay, that's a pretty complicated uh, device. This is actually a micromechanical filter. It's got two, three of these comb drive resonators. This is linking the comb drive resonators. You can see the drives. It's got two inputs, two outputs. This does a filtering function. Okay, and it's a very complicated piece there, but it looks complicated, but it's not that difficult to make. It's just drawing. Right? The person who did this just drew out the, uh, the layout. It's all just drawing. It's not just that. You've got to get the dimensions right to get the right parameters for this. But it's drawing and then boom, run the process, done, right? Not that easy, of course, but it sort of seems that way. Okay, I guess also before talking about issues, I talked about polysilicon surface micromachining, which is this top line right here. All right, so we have polysilicon. You can use different sacrificial materials, all of them oxides here. You can release in these etchants, but of course polysilicon is not the only material you can use as a structural material. You can do aluminum, Photoresist is a sacrificial material. If it's photoresist, then use an O2 plasma to get rid of that sacrificial layer. Uh, you can even make silicon dioxide materials. Right? Just turn it around. Have a silicon dioxide beam. Polysilicon is a sacrificial material. Use xenon difluoride to remove the polysilicon under it. All sorts of different recipes. Basically, to do surface micromachining, you got to figure out what can be used as a sacrificial layer and what you want to use as your structural layer. If you can get Two layers, one that etches very fast in a certain etching, another that does not, you can do surface micromachining. Okay? Now, it's not just considering these two layers. You also have to consider the other layers that are surrounding. Right? So in this process here, what are the other layers? Uh, well, these are the two layers we cared about initially, the sacrificial layer of oxide and silicon. But we also have a nitride here. And there could be other layers in this as well. So we've got to worry about how fast that nitride etches also in that etchant. Okay, so in concentrated HF, polysilicon etch rate is about zero. Okay, it's something finite, but it's, it's, it's very, very small. Uh, oxide, uh, wet thermal oxide, PSG, all of these different things, they etch at pretty fast rates. These are microns per minute type etch rates, very fast, which is what you want. Very little etch rate in the structural material, some amount of etch rate in, uh, uh, well, fast etch rate in the sacrificial material. Okay, but what about things that are around this? Okay, so silicon nitride could also be around in, a, in, a, in the process. Well, we see it there. It is a finite etch rate. It's slow. One to 14 nanometers per minute is slow. But, you know, how long can you wait? What decides for you how long you can wait? Well, what decides for you how long you can wait is how much undercutting you have to do. If I go back a few slides to our layout, okay, what are we looking for in being able to determine how, how long we have to keep this in HF? Well, 
Right? The oxide in these open field areas will go away very fast. Right? We know that, but we're going to have to wait for the oxide right here to etch away. Because right? when we look at the oxide right here, once you've etched all this stuff away, now the hydrofluoric acid has to get in there, right? Which means it's got to diffuse from all these points to get in there. Okay, so that distance, I guess the shortest distance, which might be this right here to that point, that's going to determine how long you have to etch. Okay, and while this is trying to get underneath this, to diffuse underneath this, anything out here is being attacked by HF. That means the nitride. Okay, the nitride is being attacked slowly, but there's been many cases where because the structure is so big, right, this isn't so bad, this is a comb drive device. If you have an accelerometer, which is an enormous device, you want to make those big so you get better sensitivity, better resolution, you have to wait a long time for that etching to occur unless you do some clever design tricks, which we do use. Right? But what determines how long you have to etch is this, and that's where you have to be careful about the etch rate and all those other materials here, like nitride if you have it around, or, or, or even aluminum if you have it around. Sometimes you want to coat, do your interconnects in aluminum instead of uh, polysilicon to make it more conductive. Then you've got to worry about how much any of these things, how fast any of these things etch in your release etchant. Okay, so it's a complicated, more complicated problem than just two materials you have to worry about. All right, but it's even more complicated than that. Okay, I guess I have so many slides that I forgot about here. So Kurt Williams uh, has published a couple papers. Kurt Williams was actually one of my contemporaries when I was uh, a grad student here. And he, he set out, you know, this, this is the definition of not lazy, right? He set out to, to look at all sorts of different films and look at all sorts of etching solutions. All of this done in the Berkeley at the time micro lab, not nano lab. Uh, but he set out to look at all sorts of different wet etchants and different types of materials and get their etch rates. And so the two of the papers that I have online associated with this lecture, well, should be associated with this lecture. They're actually in the last lecture. Uh, you can download and read these papers, and they have all these charts that give, all you, that give you all these different etch rates, right? They're very good things to use as a first reference to design a process. I would never trust a single one of these numbers, though, not because Kurt didn't know what he was doing, but because the situation may be different, right? Maybe your oxide is a little different than what Kurt was using. Maybe your etching was a little bit different. So I would not trust his etch rates completely, but they're at least a good starting point. And we will trust them for this class, of course. Uh, but you know, when you're actually doing processing, be careful with those. But these are nice references for you to have. Uh, I already went through this sort of thing before. There's another chart on etch chemistry, just pulling out of Kurt Williams' thing. Uh, but some of the more important types of etchants and films. Uh, but now let's talk about issues in surface micromachining. Okay, so here are some pictures of some of the issues that we get. So one of them is stiction. Okay, here's what we mean by stiction. This is sticking of devices to the substrate. Okay, so you can imagine, right, this could be infuriating. After you're done with your process, and this actually is what happened. The, the first one of these runs that we did here at Berkeley uh, for these comb drive devices. So these comb drive devices were pretty much invented here at UC Berkeley. Right? It was Roger Howe with Bill Tang, actually. And I was also I was an undergrad working in that group at the same time. So we were doing these comb drive devices at that time. Turns out these comb drive devices, they define a lot of MEMS devices that are out there because of some of the properties they had. But I remember the first process we, we ran on this. Uh, finished the process. We could look at the structures through a microscope. They looked fine. Right, so we hooked up all the voltages, and you know, we've turned the voltages on, all the calculations. You know, this should work. We're putting the right voltage on it. We're putting the right AC into it. It's near the resonance frequency. Why isn't this working? And so we just plugged away at these things for so long at that time. And we finally gave up, went back in and ran the process again. We said, OK, something's wrong. Maybe they're not released. Something went wrong. Let's run the process again. Run the process again. Right, another number of weeks, right, just running that process. Then coming out, same problem, things don't move. The problem from the very beginning was that the devices were stuck. Okay, so it's interesting, right? So we go ahead, you make a lot of assumptions when you're doing research. You go and you say, oh, I assume because I did my wet etch and I released these things, they're up. Right, but at that time, no one had done this before. No one knew about stiction, right? And then these devices were stuck, and it wasn't until one of us 
it was Bill actually who finally came in, right, with, with his probe, with, with a probe on a probe station and just poked at the device just to make sure it was moving, right? We didn't think of doing that because it was the first time, right? Now it's natural for any of my students, right? Get in there and poke the device first. But in those very first days, you know, no one thought of doing that. Once we poked the device, we saw that it moved, but it moved, and then it stayed frozen, right? It should pop back because it's a spring, but it didn't. It moved and it stayed frozen, and that told us, oh, it is released, but it's stuck somehow. And no one knew what the mechanisms were st for sticking were at the time, but it turns out that it was surface tension forces from water that was drying underneath these things. Okay, so stiction is one big issue with these types of devices. It continues to be a big issue. Well, maybe much less, because over the years, people have studied this in a big way, and there's ways to eliminate a lot of it. But it is an issue. Okay, the other issue that I, I've harped on before was residual stress. Right, if you don't know what you're doing when you're depositing your films, you don't have the right recipe, you can end up with this. Right? This was attempted to be a device that's nice and flat, but look, everything is bending up out of the structure, and the reason why it's bending up out of the structure is because these films are stressed. They have a stress gradient, and it turns out that if you know that stress gradient, you can predict pretty accurately how high that thing is going to bend up. Okay, and we're going to do that in this course. Um, but you can imagine what residual stress can do. The longer, the larger your structure, the more this is going to be a problem, right? Because small structures, right, they'll bend a certain amount. But the amount of bending you get is a function of how big it is. If you have a long thing, it bends. Even though the angle of bending is very small, at the tip of that thing, it's gone many microns. Okay, so the bigger the structure, the bigger the problem is with this. And so this has been a big problem for some of the highest volume MEMS uh, uh, products in the beginning, accelerometers, gyroscopes. Or so those are big devices with big springs or so. So a lot of work had to be done to solve those issues. Uh, finally, topography is a big problem, too. So you can have things called stringers. These are basically uh, links that aren't supposed to be there. You're supposed to have etched them away, but they're still there. We talked about this in etching. You didn't over-etch enough. You had too much topography, and so your over-etch wasn't good enough to get rid of residual features like this stringer. Okay, so let's talk about these now one at a time. Let's talk about a very important one, which is microstructure microstructure stiction. Okay, so what's happening here? This is the unintended sticking of MEMS devices to surfaces. And so how is this occurring? This is occurring during the release. Okay, not during the release, but during the drying step. Okay, so you put the thing in, in HF. Okay, and if you put the thing in HF, don't just drop it in HF. And put it in HF and agitate that thing. Okay, that's the first thing you need to do to make sure that all the stuff gets under all the crevices. Okay, once you're done with that, what are you going to do? You're going to take that thing in HF and put it in DI water. Because you've got, you've got to get rid of the HF, right? You want to handle wafers that still have HF on them, right? So you, have, you put it in DI water. And so here are a couple beams here, right? This is, a, this is a very short beam. This is a very long beam, okay? And so the shorter beam is going to be stiffer than the longer beam. I think you know that. Shorter things are harder to bend than longer things. Right, so what's happening as you're drying this? Well, the meniscus of the liquid is sort of coming in here, coming in here. And so in this thing, you can see that liquid coming in. It's just drying off, and everything is fine with this. Okay, but look what's happening with the longer beam. You're getting this drying. You keep drying, but you start forming an island here. Okay? And this island here is an island of water that actually has a surface tension force that's going to pull that structure into the substrate. Okay, why does it pull the structure into the substrate? Well, it's a, sort of a capillary condensation type thing. And we're going to do this in great detail very soon. But let me give an analogy. Right? You've worked with microscope slides right, in your biology classes or that, especially in high school or that. Right? You put a drop of water. You're going to look at the bacteria, the paramecia in that water. Right? Ever take two slides, put them together? Right? You're usually using a cover slip. Ever take two slides, put them together with water? Right? and then try to pull them apart, you can't, right? The force that's sucking those two slides together is so strong, it's very difficult to pull them apart. Right? That is a surface tension force. You can slide the slides apart, but you cannot pull them apart this way. That's exactly what's happening for these devices. Okay, they're drying, you have that meniscus, it's sucking the device down into the substrate, and now it's almost impossible to pick it up. Very difficult to pick it up. Um, so what can we do about this, right? This seems like an impossible problem to solve. So 
Obviously, it's been solved because right, you've got men shipping in the millions here. All your cell phones have them right now. Right? So what's done about this? Well, first of all, what's happening? And what are the, some, of, some of the physics involved with this? Well, first of all, it's contact angle that's part of the problem. Okay, so what is contact angle? So if this is a droplet of water or any type of liquid, I can define a contact angle in this droplet. And so let me give a few more examples in a right. Oh, I, I have the few more examples right there. Okay, so this is an example where the contact angle is greater than 90 degrees. Okay, so you're noticing, right, this, this piece of water looks like it's almost separate from the surface, right? When the contact angle is greater than 90 degrees, you have properties of your liquid versus the surface and versus the air around it, such that this liquid doesn't want to be in contact with the surface. Okay, it wants to go away. You can also have a situation where your contact angle is very small. Okay, in this case, the liquid loves that surface, so it's wetting the surface. Okay, and it's, it turns out it's these two cases that say whether your structure is going to stick or not. Okay, so a surface that invites wetting by water, okay, if the water wants to wet that surface, you're in trouble. Right? Because as you're drying, you end up with this. You end up with this sort of convex type uh, water edges of the water here. Your contact angle in this structure is actually this angle here. It's the angle that, that this thing makes sort of with the surface there. That's smaller than 90 degrees. If it's smaller than 90 degrees, you have a hydrophilic case. And if it's hydrophilic, water wants to suck to the substrate, and so it's going to suck this beam down. Okay? On the other case, if you have a surface that, for which the water or whatever liquid you're releasing in has a large contact angle greater than 90 degrees, now this doesn't want any part of the surface. And so you have a beam above this. This has got this convex type uh, uh, cross section. And so this is going to dry without any sticking. Okay, so it's the first thing to start to try to understand about this. It, it's all of whether you have that, that water, that piece of water there with a contact angle that's larger than 90 degrees or less than 90 degrees. Okay, but there's more math associated with this here. And so let's go do some more. Well, let's not. Let's stop the lecture now, like 10 minutes early. I have to head back to this other place there. Our next lecture will be Tuesday, but I guess I have to run right now. So we'll stop here, and we'll continue on Tuesday uh, next time.